All right, so today we're going to start looking at um, trigonometry. Okay, so it's going to kind of feel like it's a um, brand new, totally different than what we were doing before. Um, so what we'll do is we'll start just by kind of looking at the word trigonometry and see if we can uh, break down what, what that means. Um, does anybody see or recognize something in the word trigonometry, like a prefix or a suffix in there? Yeah. Try. All right, I heard try, I heard metri. I'll come back to that. I'm even going to go a little further. I'm going to say try gone. Anybody, anybody know um, what a trigon is? I mean, we say like hexagon, octagon. Trigon. But trigon is another name for something. Triangle. Triangle. Every flat shape has a name ending in gon. Like quadrilateral, that's a four-sided shape, but another name for it is a tetragon. That's why if you look at the name Tetris, every, every shape in Tetris is made out of four blocks because tetra means four in Tetris. Uh, so trigon is a name for a three-sided shape that we normally call a triangle. And then metri, that's a suffix you see or you see it in different subjects like uh, geometry, trigonometry, that's all I can think of. But um, <laughs> it, it is used in a couple. And metri means measurement. So the idea of trigonometry is measuring triangles. Um, so what do you mean? Just measuring a triangle just to measure it? Uh, no, like if you, let's say you had a building and Here's the ground. And you had somebody standing, let's say, right here. And they said, well, we're standing 50 feet away from the building. And we're looking up at the top of the building at an angle of 40 degrees. How tall is the building? Well, there's enough information there to find it. And all you have to do, really, is find the height of that triangle. What triangle? This triangle that I just made in red. So if you can figure out how to measure something in that triangle, you can find the height of the building. Right. So there's all kinds of problems we look at um, in trig, but a lot of times it boils down to drawing a triangle and figuring out something in the triangle. Not everything, but a lot of, a lot of things. Especially things that are calculation or numerical. Now, in trig, there's a ton of stuff that's numerical, like this problem, find the height of the building. There's other things in trig that are much more abstract. They have no numbers in them at all. So we'll, um, we'll work up to that stuff eventually. But for now, we're going to stick with lots of numbers. All right, so before we can even really uh, get into triangles or solving problems, we just want to talk about what an angle is. Okay, so just as a reminder from geometry, okay, an angle is when you have two rays and they have a common starting point. Does anybody know what you call the starting starting point where two rays come from? A vertex. A vertex, yeah. And what I drew up above, that's a picture of an angle. Okay, if I separate it, no, I can't. But it's two, two rays starting at the same point. That's the vertex. Now, if you look at that angle I just drew, it has two sides. That's one side. That's the other side. The names of those sides are the initial side and the terminal side. Okay, how do you figure out um, which one is which? Well, for positive angles, in trig, we measure an angle in the positive, using a positive number. That's a counterclockwise direction. So you start and you go counterclockwise inside the two rays. If you move counterclockwise inside the rays, you will go from the initial to the terminal. No matter how you, no matter how you draw it. Like if you draw your angle this way, you start inside the ray, 
you go counterclockwise, where you start is the initial, where you end is the terminal. I think, yeah, I have another picture down below. So here's another example. Initial side, terminal side. Start inside the rays and go counterclockwise. Wherever you end up, that's the terminal. Where you start, that's the initial. And I say to go inside the rays because you really have two angles here. Right? There's the angle inside, but then there's the angle that's on the outside. Okay, we're not really focusing on the angle on the outside. We're focusing on the one between the two rays. So the way I defined an angle, I said an angle is made up of two rays. Well, if you draw a triangle, we know that in a triangle, those aren't rays. Those are line segments. But even though that's a line segment, and that's a line segment, we can still call that an angle, even though it's not two rays. So the idea is if you're going to sketch an angle all by itself, not part of another shape, that's how you do it, two rays. If you have a polygon, we just use line segments. You don't, you don't put arrows on the end of those things because they don't keep going. They stop because they're sides in a triangle. Questions on that? Now, actually, I had something up there. This this thing. I'm going to talk more about what that is. But does anybody know what what that is? Maybe not the name of it, but do you even know what type of thing it is? Yeah. It's isn't it theta? It's like what's what's a theta? It, it represents how much degrees a certain angle is. Where does it come from? Like what? T H E T A, Greek. Yes, it's a Greek. It's a letter from the Greek alphabet. Um, and a lot of times when we label or we talk about angles, um, we use Greek letters. So these are all different Greek letters we can use to represent angles. It's just like in algebra, like you use X or Y or M or Q, just different letters. What's nice about this is that if you write a Greek letter. We always assume it's an angle. That's kind of the convention in, in trigonometry. Um, so we'll go through them. We just went through the fourth one. That's theta. Anybody know the name of the first one? Is it Greek letter? The first one, it's the first letter in the, in the Greek alphabet. Yes? It's alpha. Okay, so alpha is the um, symbol that I wrote. How about the second one? Anybody know that one? Yep, that one's beta. Okay, that one, um, it's not quite as easy because it looks like a Y, but it's gamma. That one's theta. And these are all lowercase. Greek letters have upper and lowercase, just like English letters. A lot of the uppercase letters in Greek look similar to English letters. Not all of them, but some of them. And that one is omega. Okay, you might have seen capital omega. It looks like this. Anybody ever seen that before? If, you, if you're in engineering or you do anything with electricity, you might see that symbol. That symbol means resistance in ohms. Ohms. Yep. Okay, but we're using lowercase omega. So we're definitely not going to use all of these today. But from now on, you know if I write a Greek letter, it's an angle. Okay. Some textbooks use capital letters and lowercase letters to differentiate between sides and angles. Um, but the problem with that is, think about the letter C. If I just put down a C, you can't tell if that's capital or lowercase. There's no context around it. There's no other letters to determine. So I think it's confusing to use capital and lowercase letters for angles and sides. That's why Greek letters will always be angles. 
English letters, science. All right, so standard position is a way you can draw an angle. And what it basically does is it gets kind of a, a uniform way. Like if I said to you, sketch a 45 degree angle, and that's all I said, everybody's could look a little different. Some people might sketch it like that. Some people might sketch it like that, like that. Some people might sketch it like that. But if I say to sketch it in standard position, then everybody should look the same. Okay, so standard position means your vertex is at the origin. Okay, so think of having like an x, y axis. Put the vertex at the origin and put the initial side on the positive x axis. Okay, just like that. So two things have to happen in order for your angle to be in standard position. One, the vertex is at the origin. Two, um, initial side is on the positive x-axis. All right, so what if I went like that? Is that standard position? No, it's not the origin. No, it's not at the origin. The initial side is still on the positive x-axis. But the vertex is an empty origin. All right, what if I did something like, like that? Is that standard position? No. The vertex is on the origin. That's good. And the terminal side is on the positive y-axis. But the definition of standard position doesn't say anything about terminal side. It says initial side. Okay. Now the initial side is, is up in the air. So, any question on what it means to have an angle in standard position? Right. So now, we'll, now that we've defined angles and kind of explained uh, how to draw them, one way you can measure an angle is in degrees. Before I show you, does anybody know the other way that's used in trig a lot besides degrees? Yeah? Radians. Radians, yeah. And when we use a calculator to start doing some, some trick stuff, we're going to have to be careful about what mode the calculator is in. Um, I don't think we're going to use the calculator today. But we have to make sure we're either in radians or degrees, okay? depending on, on what the problem is asking for. All right, so if you imagine like uh, movement on a circle, does anybody know how many degrees it would be to, to rotate all the way around? Yeah, it would be 360. So what if you did a half counterclockwise? Yeah, that would be 180. Now when you write down how much, there's two things you have to pay attention to. How much and what direction. How about a quarter of a counterclockwise revolution? 90. That would be 90. So these kind of angles come up a lot. Angles that are multiples of 30, like 30, 60, 90, 120, and angles that are multiples of 45. Okay, we're going to see those all over the place in trig. So if you measure an angle counterclockwise, that's the positive direction. Okay, so what do you think would happen if you measure an angle clockwise? What kind of angle would that be? Negative. Negative. So the only difference between clockwise and counterclockwise is whether or not you're measuring a negative or a positive angle. And I'll show you kind of an example. Okay, so in this program, 
I can't move the initial side. All I can do is move the terminal side. And the vertex is always at the origin. So the angles that I'm showing you in this program are standard position. And as you drag this around, okay, it's showing you the angle in both radians, uh, degrees in the top, radians in the bottom. Okay. And that's in the clockwise, uh, counterclockwise direction. Okay. If you start to go more than one revolution, then your angle starts to get bigger than 360. And you can go as, as many times as you want. Well, just make it a spiral? Um, yeah, I think it just kind of makes it spiral. That's awesome. Yeah. So, you can go back the other way. So now, if you start to go clockwise, that's a negative angle. Now spin it that way. Yeah, it gets spin that way too. So, clockwise, counterclockwise, the only difference is positive or negative. Generally, if we had an angle that went around that many times, let's say it stopped right here, negative 2,610 degrees. That's a really big negative number to have to work with. So as long as we could find another angle where the red ball circle thingy stops right there, we could use that instead. So instead of that one, you could use that, or that number, or that number. And what I'm doing is I'm trying to make the angle smaller so it's easier to work with, but I'm still stopping at the same spot, straight down. All these numbers I'm showing you, for trig purposes, uh, that's negative 450. Okay. For trig purposes, are exactly the same. So negative 450 is the same as negative 90, which is the same as positive 270. So that really big angle that I started with that was negative, would, in trig, would be exactly the same as the angle 270. It's exactly the same spot. Usually we don't care about all the extra revolutions, so we just take them off. Okay, so we've already seen that. Angles can be larger than 360 in the positive or negative direction if you make more than one revolution. Okay, so all those angles that I was showing you, um, let, me, let me bring up one more. 270. and negative 90. Those two angles have exactly the same initial and terminal sides. Just look, the initial side is horizontal, the vertical side is the terminal. It's going straight up and down. It's exactly the same right there. In fact, if that red spiral wasn't there to show you, you wouldn't be able to see the difference between that yeah. and that. If you can't tell the difference between two angles, because their initial and terminal sides are the same, they are called coterminal. Okay. So from the, from the picture, you might have, might have already seen how you can find coterminal angles. You can just take any angle and add or subtract 360. Okay. Adding or subtracting revolutions will give you angles that are coterminal, and there's an infinite amount. You can just keep adding or subtracting 360. So any questions on uh, what it means for angles to be coterminal? Let's look at an example. So we're going to sketch an angle in standard position, and we're not going to use a protractor, so we're not going to measure it out. We're just going to you know, roughly sketch it. And I want to find that same angle written as a negative and written as a positive. Okay, I just showed you one. Negative 90 is exactly the same as 270. Negative, positive. And it's also exactly the same as 630. Negative 90, 630, 270. They're all the same. 
Okay. So I'm gonna, I want to do that right here. Okay. So we'll start with um, 30 degrees. Okay, since it's in standard position, you're gonna put, start with the initial side. It's always gonna be on the x-axis. Now for 30 degrees, where would the where would the terminal side be? Anyone describe yep, Ezekiel? Up, like up, not down. Yeah, it'd be up a little bit. Would it be like straight up? No. No, because straight up would be how much? 90. That straight up would be 90. So it's a third of the way. Right? One third of the way towards 90. Um, so just kind of estimate it. You know, if that's to me, that looks like it's about half. Uh, just go a little less than half. Okay, so there's our sketch. And now we want to find a coterminal angle that's positive and negative. Let's try actual writing. Positive, negative. Um, can somebody give me an angle that would be coterminal with 30? That's positive. Yep. Negative 330? Um, yep. If you subtract 360, that would be the negative one. So you could do negative 330. How about what would you add to 30 to find an angle that's coterminal and positive? Yep. 390, and you added how much? Right. Just add and subtract 360. So two different angles that are coterminal with 30 degrees. Questions on that? All right, let's try 145. Okay, so let's start with my initial. Okay, so I've got that. Now 145, well, let's figure out if you went straight up for the terminal side, how many degrees would that be? That would be 90. What if you went straight to the left for the terminal side? That would be 180. Well, if you average 90 and 180, add them up and divide by 2, you get 135. So 135 is right in the middle, 145 a little bit past the middle. Okay. All right, so if that's the middle, roughly, let's go a little past the middle. And that's 145. So now let's find a coterminal angle. It's positive, negative. All right, so Andrew, what would I add to 145 to get an angle that's coterminal and positive? 360. Yep, just add, add one revolution. You could even do it more than once if you wanted, but they only want one answer. Yeah. So there's another angle that's coterminal. All these angles I'm showing you are all coterminal. Um, and now, what would I do to get an angle that's coterminal but negative? Subtract 360. 360. Negative 215. Or negative 575. Or negative 935. Doesn't matter. And let's try one more. Negative 45. There's my initial. Where would my terminal side be this time? Describe it as the quadrant, like in the upper right, upper left, lower right, lower left. 
Where, where would it end up? Bottom right, halfway. Yeah, it's going to be the bottom right because we're going negative 45. That's clockwise. And 45 splits the quadrant right in half. Okay, so coterminal angle that's negative would be subtract 360 from that. And just trust me, you would get 405. And if you add 360, I don't know why I switched negative positive, but a positive one would be 315. Okay. Any questions on that? So all those things we, we just described um, are just different ways of writing the same angle. Which one is the best? I generally like to work with angles between 0 and 360. Okay, that way it's not too big, it's not negative. All right, um, let's look at a, a few other definitions. Um, what's an acute angle? Yep. Um, angle 45 degree less. 90 degrees or, yeah. or less? Yeah. So it could equal 90? No, that's right. So it has to be less than 90, but it also has to be more than something. Think about the kind of angles we talked about today. It has to be more than zero. So it's between zero and 90. Not equal to 90, because that's going to be something else. And not equal to zero, because obviously if you had a zero degree angle, do you even have an angle? Not really. Um, right angle. That's, Brandon had just mentioned that. That's when your angle is exactly 90. How about obtuse? What's an obtuse angle? Greater than 90, but less than 80. Greater than 90, but less than 180. And all those definitions just apply to a single angle by itself. If I just gave you an angle, drew it on paper, and said, describe it as acute, right, or obtuse, you could just do that with a single angle. This next definition requires two angles. I couldn't just draw this on paper and say, is that complementary? That doesn't make sense. Does anybody know what it means for angles to be complementary? They both have to equal 90? No, they, it doesn't have to do with what each individual angle equals. It has more to do with the something of the angles. The sum. The sum. So it's two angles that add up to 90. But they don't have to equal 90. You know, you could have like 80 and 10. But they have to be positive. So another way to say that is you could say two acute angles that add up to 90. And by saying acute, that would automatically mean positive. Okay. Um, does anybody know the other type? Angles can be complementary or supplementary. supplementary. That's when they add up to 180. And they don't have to be next to each other, like, like for complementary angles. You could have something like that. And that. And you could say, yep, those are complementary because they add to 90. They're still complementary, even though I separated them. That's fine. Negative angles do not have complements or supplements. So if I said to you, what's the complement of negative 10? There isn't one. Okay. Supplement of negative 10? There isn't one. All right, so let's look at some angles and see if we can find the complement and uh, the supplement. Okay, the complement is what would you add to get 90? Supplement? 
is what would you add to get 180? Okay, what's the complement of 48 degrees? Yeah, Ezekiel? 42. That's the complement. What's the supplement? 132. Just add 90 to the complement and you get the supplement. All right, let's do um, negative 18. What's the complement of negative 18? Nothing. Doesn't apply. What about the supplement? Nothing. Doesn't apply. X. Assuming X is a positive. If X was negative, you'd write doesn't apply. But assuming X is a positive number, greater than zero. What would be the complement of X? minus x. So whatever x is, subtract it from 90, and that's the complement. How about the supplement? 180 minus whatever x is. And again, I'm assuming x is positive. Any questions on complement, supplement? Last thing we're going to look at. Another way to measure an angle besides degrees is in radians. So I'm going to try to describe a little bit about what a radian is, and then I'll show you a formula for how you convert between degrees and radians. The idea of a radian has something to do with a circle. And if you look at the word radian, does anybody see another word using those letters that it's kind of similar to? And it has something to do with a circle? Radius. Has to do with radius. So radian and radius are, are connected. And I'm going to try to show you that connection right now. So what I've drawn here is a circle. And I drew an angle inside the circle. Because I drew the angle with the vertex right at the center of the circle, that's called a central angle. Now, as the rays come out from point C, they hit the edge of the circle here and there. I call those two points A and B. Between A and B, if you connect them, you have an arc. Okay, that's called arc AB. All right, now, let's say you took a piece of string, okay, and you laid it on that red arc, and you measured the length of the red arc. Okay? You write down the number for how long the piece of string is. Okay? Then you take a piece of string, and you put it on ray CB. That's the radius. Okay? And you write that number down. Well, if you measure this arc, and you measure that radius, and they come out exactly the same, then that means this angle right there is one radian. Okay? That's, that's the connection. If the size of that arc, say it came out to 10 inches, and the size of this radius came out to 10 inches, then that means that angle is one radian. Okay, so angle ACB would come out to exactly one radian If the length of the arc, which I call the arc AB, came out exactly the same as the radius. Now, if the arc came out bigger than the radius, then the angle is bigger than one radian. If the arc came out smaller, let's say your, your angle was like this, 
Now you'd have a really short arc. If the arc was shorter than the radius, your angle would be smaller than one radian. That still doesn't tell you how to convert between radians and degrees, but it kind of gives you visually an idea, like geometrically, what a radian would look like. Any question on that idea? And that picture that I drew is pretty accurate. I mean, well, yeah, it's a little off. That's that's not exactly to scale. It's it's close. But that's not exactly what one radian would look like. It would actually be a little bit smaller than that because I think that arc is too big. If it was supposed to be the same size as ours. show you this. this circle. Okay, this word is going to come up um, a lot when we do trig. We're going to spend a whole week talking about what's called the unit circle. All that a unit circle is, is a circle that has a radius of 1. A unit circle is a circle with radius 1. Now, I'm going to tell you a special fact about a unit circle. Without this fact, I can't show you how to convert between radians and degrees. So you just have to trust me that this fact is, is true. In a circle that's a radius of 1, okay, in a unit circle, the following happens. The measure of the angle in radians comes out exactly the same as the length of the arc. The, if you measure an angle on a unit circle, it has to be a unit circle. If you measure an angle on a unit circle in radians, it will come out exactly the same as the length of the arc. Okay, so what, is, what does that mean like with an example? Here's a, here's a unit circle. Pretend that the radius is 1. And let's draw that angle right there. So there's two things that come out the same. The measure of this angle and the length of that arc. If that arc came out to, I don't know, let's say two inches, that angle would be two radians. If that arc came out to three inches, that angle would be three radians. If it was 12 inches, 12 radians. Six inches, six radians. They're the same on a unit circle. That's what I'm trying to explain here. So angle size and arc size are the same on a unit circle. Any question on that idea? All right. So how can we use that to figure out something? Well, let's go back to this idea. How many degrees in one revolution? 360. So what I'm going to try to do is I don't know how many radians in one revolution. I have no idea, but I don't need to find the angle. What I can do instead is if I can figure out the circumference, if I can find the length of that arc, it will be exactly the same as the measure of the angle. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the, the circumference. That's the arc that goes all the way around the circle. And if I can find the length of that arc, I will automatically know how big the angle is that goes all the way around the circle. Because they come out the same. All right. So again, what I was saying, 
If you can find the length of this arc that goes all the way around the circle, whatever it comes out to is going to be exactly the same as the angle that goes all the way around the circle because they're the exact same number in this kind of circle. Okay, so let's find the length of the arc that goes all the way around this circle. Anybody remember the formula for um, circumference of a circle? Yeah? Um, part of it, something we need in front. Two. Circumference is two pi r. Now, if we're on a unit circle, I told you earlier what the radius is. How much is it? It's one. So the circumference of a unit circle is two pi. Okay. Well, if the let me go back. If the circumference, which the circumference is an arc, just a special arc that's really, really big. But if the circumference is 2 pi, it's exactly the same as the angle in radians. So if the circumference is 2 pi, then the angle in radians is also equal to 2 pi. So what that means is to go all the way around a circle in radians, it's 2 pi. So 2 pi is exactly the same as 360. Okay, so now, now that we know that, we can use that fact to figure out anything we want. It's like if I tell you in one foot there's 12 inches, you can use that fact to figure out anything you want because I gave you a starting point. 1 foot equals 12. 360 equals 2 pi. You, you've got a starting point. But we can actually simplify it a little bit. Um, what could I divide each side by to make the numbers smaller? Yeah, I could divide each side by 2. That's like saying, you know, if I said, well, in 6 inches, it's half a foot. Yeah, of course. You just divided each side by 2. But when you give somebody a conversion, it usually has a certain number in it. Okay? I'm going to give you some conversions and see if you can tell me what number is in all of them. Okay? In one foot, 12 inches. In one day, 24 hours. In one year, 365 days. Um, in one minute, 60 seconds. All those conversions have what number in them? One. You don't usually give someone a conversion and say, in three feet, there's 36 inches. No, you simplify it for them. One foot, 12 inches. Well, let's do the same thing here. Um, what could I do to get a one on the right side? Yeah, divide each side by five. And now, look what we have. We have a formula for one radian. One radian is exactly 180 divided by pi degrees. So how much is it? We'll take 180 divided by 3.14. That's roughly how many degrees in one radian. It's about 50 something. Now, if I wanted to know two radians, all I would have to do is this, times two, times two. Now I've got a formula for two radians. Take it, multiply by 180, divide by pi. Let's say I wanted a formula for 7 radians. How many degrees? Multiply by 7, multiply by 7. If I did that calculation out, that would tell me how many radians in a degree. The key is right here. If you want to convert radians to degrees, you multiply by 180 and you divide by pi. That's the second one. If you want to convert radians to degrees, you multiply by 180, and you divide by pi. If you want to convert the other way, you just reverse it. Okay. So if you want to convert degrees to radians, those are the two steps. Multiply by pi, divide by 180. They're very similar, so it's easy to mix them up. But if you can remember, when I say degrees, I want you to think 180. 
you think degrees, think of the number 180. When you think of radians, think of pi. Okay, if you just remember that idea, you really don't have to remember these steps. Degrees, think 180. Radians, think pi. Okay, so we'll finish up just by converting a couple problems to degrees and then a couple to radians. So anytime you convert between degrees and radians, you have two choices. It's either going to be pi over 180 or 180 over pi. Every time. I have degrees in the top. I'm trying to convert to radians. Where would degrees have to go in the fraction on the right to cancel out degrees in the top? It would have to go in the bottom. Degrees would have to be in the bottom. Radians would have to be in the top. Now degrees would cancel out. Now what's the number I said to always think of when you think degrees? 180. What's the number to think of when you think pi? When you think radians? Pi. So put the pi next to radians. And now we just do it up. 30 pi over 180. Um, and 30 does go into 180 evenly. How many times? Six. It's pi over six. When you write a final answer in radians, you usually don't put RAD. I kind of did that just to help you at first, but that's how you write the final answer. The only, thing, the only time you label it is if you need it to be in degrees. Okay. Let's try one more. What would you multiply by to convert 45 degrees to radians? Degrees would have to go in the bottom to cancel degrees in the top. 180 always goes with degrees. Pi always goes with radians. Pretend that it says RAD, it's invisible. 45 goes into 180 how many times? goes in four times. And the last one I'll do will convert uh, back the other way. I'll put RAD on this one just to help you out, but you've got to get used to not seeing it. If you want to convert to degrees, you want radians to disappear. Where would radians go to disappear in the fraction on the right? Bottom. What number do you always put next to radians? Pi. What number goes next to degrees? What cancels out there? Pi. What else? Something else cancels out completely. Radians. So now you're left with 3 times 180 divided by 2. Well, I reduce first. Now I'm left with 3 times 90. 3 times 9 is 27. So 3 times 90, 270. You have to put the circle. If it's degrees, you've got to put it. Radians, don't put it. All right, so we'll, um, we'll look more at the homework tomorrow if we need to practice more radians to degrees. OK, so uh, homework's on 323. Um, all the problems are very fast, like find the complement, find the supplement, find a coterminal angle, change the degrees, change the radians. Very, very quick. Okay, so that's 6.1 part one. Um, we're going to do half, the other half of 6.1 tomorrow, and then we'll do half of 6.2, and then on Thursday we'll finish 6.2.